The next group of facing images shows a symbolic crucifixion and the Mass of St. Earhart. In other words, uh, St. Earhart is a priest who is celebrating Mass. Now, right away, there's um, a very familiar parallel between a scene of the crucifixion and a scene of a Mass, uh, which is, I guess I should explain some of the terms. Um, a Mass is the sacrament of the bread and wine. It is the chief sacrament uh, of the Christian Church. It is, uh, it, each priest must say a Mass every day. Uh, there's a lot of other names that have been attached to it, the, the communion service, the, uh, uh, the sacrifice of the bread and wine, the Eucharist. Um, and in the Catholic Church, and of course at this time, in the West, there is only the Catholic Church. Uh, we have the Orthodox Church in the East. Uh, but Christ's death on the cross is a sacrifice. And that sacrificial death is reenacted in every Mass. And the Mass is efficacious, um, which is a word you often hear in, in medieval use. Um, by efficacious, it means it works. It's effective. In other words, it was believed that when masses were said, merits were created uh, to help save mankind. Let's look at the crucifixion. Um, we see Christ in this uh, great mandorla, sort of a huge body halo, and then a parallel one uh, to two figures below. Um, and once again, very symmetrical image with uh, very rich uh, scroll work and decorations and scenes. Um, there seems to be a contrast uh, between the two sides of the composition. On Christ's right, which would be our left, uh, we have, down below, we have life. And then in the sort of half circle uh, right off the center uh, on the far uh, well, our left, Christ's right, uh, we have uh, a personification of the church, Ecclesia. On the other side, uh, the other half circle, uh, on our right, Christ's left, is uh, the synagogue. We'll talk about uh, that. And down below in the large uh, mandorla, uh, the figure that's uh, uh, leaning over, uh, seem to be falling over, is death. What's, oh, and uh, some of the other figures. Um, in the top squares, you have two personifications who seem to be uh, veiling or unveiling themselves. Uh, these are personifications of the sun and the moon. And uh, there was supposed to be an eclipse at the time of the crucifixion. So they uh, very often appear in, uh, for example, Carolingian, and it's the, the period before the Ottonian period, um, often has its crucifixions with these personifications of the sun and the moon. And, of course, that continues on uh, into uh, later eras. The image of Christ is a Christ triumphant. Now, basically, when you have Christ on the cross, a crucifixion, you have two types of Christ. Um, the Christ triumphant, as far as we know, seems to be the oldest one. There's a 6th century um, manuscript uh, that's called the Rebula Gospels from Syria, and it shows this Christ triumphant. Um, there's, I believe it's 5th century ivory where Christ is in a loincloth, but once again he seems to be alive on the cross uh, and doesn't seem to be suffering. The suffering Christ comes in in the 9th century uh, in some Carolingian manuscripts, including the Utrecht Psalter, for those of you who know that uh, Psalter from other classes, such as if you've taken Art History 1, for example. Um, so at the time of the Ottonian period, the period we're talking about now in Germany, uh, people have a choice. <laughs> uh, the manuscript illuminators can create a tri Christ triumphant or a Christ patience, uh, Christ suffering. Here we have the triumphant Christ. And how do we know? Well, he's alive. His eyes are open. 
uh, he stands <laughs> he erect on the cross. His body doesn't sway to one side. He doesn't sag down. Uh, he doesn't appear to be suffering. He is clothed in much more than just a loincloth. And even the crown of thorns, uh, the artist has drawn a little red line around the edge, sort of enclosing it. It makes it more like a crown than a device of suffering. So when we talk about the Christ triumphant, what the artist is trying to show is the divine Christ who has conquered sin and death. He is triumphant over sin and death. Perhaps I should go into Christian theology a little bit, and maybe I should, uh, I should probably should have done this at the beginning, but uh, make a little caveat. Every once in a while when I'm teaching uh, medieval and Renaissance art, somebody gets very upset because they say, oh, you're, you're teaching uh, Christianity or you're teaching Catholicism. Um, I'm teaching history, and the theological background is very, very much part of history. And you would falsify history if you tried to teach it without um, it would just simply be a lie. So when I tell you all these theological things, um, I am not telling you you have to believe these or you, you don't have to believe these. You know, that's, that's up to you. Um, I'm not saying do believe it, don't believe it. I'm saying this is what people of the time believed. These are the ideas that informed the artwork. And I should say that these ideas are still, um, um, they, they're, they're still current. Uh, they're not something that's you know, dead and gone and, and there's nobody uh, who believes them anymore. They are very, very much part of uh, uh, Catholicism, uh, its history, and uh, the, every mass, <laughs> every single mass. Christians believe that when man first sinned, Adam and Eve, they brought sin and death into the world. And mankind was never good enough to save himself. And there was, uh, you know, God tried various things. He sent the great flood of Noah to wipe out the bad people. Uh, but mankind continued to sin. So he sent Mo Moses with the law. And uh, not just the Ten Commandments, but all those laws in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And so now you've got the rules, follow the rules. Only people didn't. People continued to sin. And Finally, it became apparent that man could not, sit, could not save himself. Uh, everybody was going to hell. <laughs> no one was getting into heaven in the afterlife. And that was a situation that God did not want. There's a wonderful medieval story, I think it's a little later than this, describes sort of God on the throne with justice on one side and mercy on the other, both pleading their case about what should be done about sinful mankind. And you know, mercy wants them all to be saved, and justice says, well, that's not right uh, because they don't deserve it. Uh, there has to be a sacrifice to make up for all of the sins that have gone uh, on in the, the history of the world. And no human being can do that. They're just not good enough. So God decides that he himself, or his son, uh, will incarnate, will become, will take on human flesh, and will suffer and die in atonement for the sins of other people. I suppose you could say it's on a cosmic scale, it's like if you had somebody you loved very much and you could afford to, you pay off their debts. Um, he's paying the debt for all mankind. So according to Christianity then, uh, what you have to do is you call upon the merits of Christ in order to, when they say be saved, they mean be able to go to heaven. So here we see Christ who has now conquered sin and death. Uh, the detail at the bottom, these two parallel images with vita, life, and mors, death, and they are labeled, and that's why we can be sure what they mean. Um, we have the, the one figure in, with her upraised hands, uh, upraised in prayer, uh, looking up at the cross. Life is very richly dressed with this uh, beautiful pink and light blue. And then death is defeated. Uh, there seems to be a branch or something coming out of the uh, shaft of the cross, almost like it's hitting death and uh, knocking it over. Um, and it, it curves in the same way. As you can see, death is sort of falling over. Uh, he's, he's muzzled. He's, uh, got, uh, uh, he's gagged. He's got cloth across his mouth. Um, his spear is, is limp. It's, it's breaking. It's, it's falling over. 
Uh, so he is utterly defeated. Um, and there are inscriptions on it that emphasize this, you know, that tell us that the, what we're seeing in the visual images that, you know, we can be quite certain this is what it means because the inscriptions say, the cross is the destruction of death. The cross is the renewal of life. Now, here we see two images which can be called grace and the law or the church and synagogue. And perhaps I better say something about this. I'm sure that probably most of you are aware uh, that the relationship between the Jews and the Christians in the Middle Ages was not good. It always seems odd to me uh, that the Christians worshiped a Jew, Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, as God. And all of the founders of the religion, the apostles, the Virgin Mary, Mary Magdalene, you know, all of the followers of Christ, uh, in the very earliest years, were Jewish. And that Christ says he comes to fulfill the prophets. And yet, um, an antagonism grew up between Christianity and Judaism. Uh, probably in the early years, they were uh, Com uh, competing for convent, uh, converts. By this time, of course, the Jews did not try to convert anyone. Um, uh, there were so many rules and laws um, prohibiting the Jews from owning land, from working land. Remember, it's an agricultural society. Um, the Jews essentially were owned by uh, the dukes or kings of different countries. Uh, who could tax them very, very heavily. Uh, oftentimes what they, they ended up doing was lend, essentially being bankers, lending money at interest. And if the interest rates were high, remember that's because the lords were taking from the Jews <laughs> everything that they could, uh, uh, sometimes more than they could perhaps. Um, there seemed to be this hatred, and one of the reasons was because the Christians blamed the Jews for Christ's death. They said the Jews killed Christ. And I actually have even heard this. Um, the school I was at before, I had a student write it on a paper, which just shocked me. Uh, I thought, don't you read the Bible? <laughs> um, if you know anything about um, the Roman Empire, and uh, the, the Romans ruled Judea at the time of Christ, and uh, the Jews did not have the right of capital punishment. Only the Roman governor, only the Romans could impose that. And the Romans would, you know, kill Jews extensively. They didn't care, <laughs> um, you know. And crucifixion is a Roman method of execution. It's not a Jewish method of execution. But of course, by the Middle Ages, they didn't know that. Um, and they, they blamed the Jews. And so there is uh, the source of uh, the antagonism and the persecutions were very awful. Um, many of those persecutions are in the future here, uh, I must, must say. Many of them are uh, 14th, 15th, 16th century. Uh, but uh, even when they're living together uh, in the same country, uh, there's, there's there's certainly an antagonism of uh, the theology which believes that Christianity superseded Judaism and therefore there's no need for Judaism anymore. Um, and they believe that the Jews are just stubborn, that they won't convert to Christianity and they're wrong and you know, this, this is their belief system. Um, which makes it very hard on the individuals who are <laughs> subject to that. But what you're seeing here is this, 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 this contrast. And the idea is grace. Uh, grace is a, essentially mercy. Um, that God was so merciful, or God was so gracious, that he allowed mankind, uh, that God was so gracious that he found a way for man to be saved uh, by sacrificing himself. And so uh, grace or mercy is shown on one side in the kind of personification of the church. On the other side, they often talk about the law 
and by this they mean the law of the Old Testament and all of the different rules in, for example, Leviticus um, and other books. And uh, Christians felt that the law was fulfilled and superseded by Christianity, and they didn't have to follow those rules. Um, basically, they, they kind of picked and chose. I mean, they didn't throw out the Ten Commandments, for example. Um, and every once in a while, you'll find them uh, quoting, and even today, you know, they'll, they'll take one rule and uh, say, well, this is what God says, and they'll ignore all the other rules around it. So what you're, they're saying is that Christianity has superseded the law of the Old Testament, and so the law of the Old Testament essentially is waning. And it makes that parallel between the sun rising and setting. So it says the law sets in the West, and you see the law is sort of uh, the personification. Uh, the, the, the eyes and the top of the head are below the border, uh, below that crescent, so we can't see. It looks like it's, it's, it's setting, essentially, like the sun's setting. Holy grace rises in the East. So grace or mercy, uh, which they associate with uh, the church and with Christianity, is, you know, uh, shining on the world. Uh, you'll note that grace and wita, life, uh, are pretty much wearing the same clothing. You know, they, they seem to be uh, identified with each other. Well, grace makes eternal life possible. Grace brings life. And there's a parallel not of the costume but of the pose between uh, the law or the synagogue which is uh, sort of bending over and, and setting uh, and death who is uh, bending over and, and you know falling uh, falling over uh, some of the iconography that we see there we later see in images of the synagogue uh, I'm thinking of some uh, 14th century images of uh, a Strasbourg where uh, the synagogue is holding a broken sphere a spear, it's not spear, spear, <laughs> um, just as uh, death does here. So the old law, uh, they're making the parallel, is bringing death.